Bad Lieutenant Port of Call, New Orleans. Uh, yeah, Bad Lieutenant Port of Call, New Orleans. What an ungainly title. Um, yes. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans was, to put it mildly, in a right old state. We begin Bad Lieutenant Port of Call, New Orleans, with police officers Terence McDonough, Nick Cage, and Stevie Pruitt, Val Kilmer, deciding quite what to do with a prisoner in a holding cell, floodwaters rising. Pruitt says, why waste your nice clothes diving into a river of muck to spare someone who's presumably a lost cause? But, despite protesting the resultant state of his $55 underwear, McDonough jumps in nonetheless, opens a cell, earning himself a promotion to lieutenant and an injury that manifests as crippling back pain for his heroism. It's an interesting choice to open this movie on a moral act of McDonough's, because from here on in it's all downhill for the character. One quick prescription for Vicodin and a six months later caption and McDonough is out on the streets shaking down petty criminals for either their cash or their class A drugs and quite happy to hold a boyfriend at gunpoint while they watch their partner engage in arrest avoiding sexual favours. How the mighty have fallen. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, McDonough finds himself investigating the murder of a family of five Senegalese illegal immigrants, the patriarch of which appears to have been involved in dealing crack. Thus begins the police procedural aspect of the movie, though the emphasis throughout remains very much on the increasingly unhinged and depraved behaviour of Cage's character as he works the case, using every aspect of his investigation to leverage those involved for the benefit of his now rampant drug habits. After all, there's nothing wrong with benefiting personally from an active murder investigation, right? <laughs> In some respects, this movie is not what I imagine a Herzog narrative movie to be. And I say that because aside from his documentary work, I realised recently that I've only ever seen this in Rescue Dawn. Without the involvement of Herzog and Cage, more of him in a minute, B.L. Pocno would be a very... <laughs> <laughs> B.L. Pocno would be a pretty run-of-the-mill corrupt cop B-movie with an absolutely perfunctory <laughs> procedural overlay. Somehow, however, in playing freeform jazz with William M. Finkelstein's script as the movie was shot, Herzog has injected just enough of his own left-field signature to elevate it from the norm and has given Cage just enough run on the line to make it a thoroughly entertaining, if occasionally depraved, piece of entertainment. Yes, we get crazy howling whooping cage here, but the tone of his performance remains just sombre enough to convince us that events are either believable or convincingly explained away as the interpretation of a crack-addled mind. <laughs> Much as leaving Las Vegas gave us the occasional alcohol fueled aside as a window into that performance, here, among other things, we get hallucinated iguanas seemingly shuffling about to the strains of Johnny Adams singing Release Me, which, of course, no one but McDonough can see, no matter how much he protests to his colleagues. <laughs> it's actually one of the more enjoyable performances Cage has given in the last 20 years, notwithstanding the straight-to-VOD material I have no compulsion to check, and with the caveat that enjoyable does not condone McDonough's actions. <laughs> the supporting cast is a surprisingly robust assortment of familiar faces, some of whom I had completely forgotten in the intervening decade since we originally reviewed this. Eva Mendez is criminally underused as McDonough's call girl partner, more of a means for the crooked cop to crowbar money and drugs out of clients than anything substantial character-wise. Other notable mentions go to Shea Wiggum. Oh yeah! <laughs> as someone McDonough really ought not to have shaken down. And Exhibit, no less, as a local drugs kingpin who, if nothing else, got to be on set the day Nick Cage delivered the line, shoot him again, his soul is still dancing. <laughs> With no real moral judgment to seemingly make, no purpose other than to stir things up a bit, and an ending that comes in at 90 degrees to the madness, it is hard to commit to something so fragile as words exactly what it is Port of Call manages to achieve. In 2010, Scott described this film as, quote, absolute garbage, but really, really brilliant garbage, unquote. <laughs> we struggled then to qualify quite what was so great about it, but we very much enjoyed it. Despite having forgotten everything bar the soul still dancing in the intervening years, I was surprised to find that age has largely not wearied Port of Call, and I once again thoroughly enjoyed it. Much as back then, I think you really should watch it, though I make absolutely no case for it. Yes, it's a strange one. This, I still enjoyed it. I was glad to see I, I still more or less liked it as much as I recall liking it uh, yeah. a decade plus ago. Yeah, but I don't think I have any better rationale for it. Um, a no, lot absolutely of it, not. Is, as you said, is bog standard procedural fare happen uh, with a somewhat corrupt ending. But if you if this was a slightly shinier police, policeman uh, doing the 
investigation that would not be any dissimilar to anything you'd see on you know, any of a number of television criminal procedurals that are lousing up everyone's uh, most watched TV charts in the past mm. decade or so. It's actually quite ordinary in that regard. A really run of the mill, actually, if you strip yeah. everything else back. Yeah, yeah, and it is just the the actions of our lead character that makes this uh, something a bit spicier, a bit different. And yeah, while. It's a bit easier to get behind this guy, certainly than Harvey Keitel's lieutenant, because he does at least seem to have some concept of doing his job mm. when he's doing this, which seemed almost incidental to anything that Harvey Keitel was doing as a bad lieutenant. But you know, he does seem at least somewhat motivated to find criminals, which is good for a cop, I think. Uh, it's just more or less the job description. <laughs> um, and yes, it is. I only really remembered the weird things. I don't think I'd remembered quite how procedural a lot of it is and quite how actually mundane quite you know, there's maybe an hour of just normal things happening in this mm. it's just the the other hour that's a, a bit off kilter and then increasingly strange as it gets up to an ending which it, it's the sort of ending that you would think would be later be revealed to be his sort of dream yeah. for being in a drug-induced coma as yep. everything suddenly starts going right after having gone incredibly wrong up until that point and all just sort of slides together somehow through a a, a a divine intervention almost more than anything else. Maybe that's his redemption, but uh, not that he sought it. Uh, yeah, lots of things to like, lots of the, the lovely character touches from the, the robust supporting cast. And uh, I guess I still enjoyed it. Quite certainly, it's much easier to recommend Portugal New Orleans uh, than the other badly dent film of what we done spoke. Um, yes, it's, it is well worth a look. And you know, like yourself, I do need to dig out some more Herzog stuff. So that's uh, something I think we will mm. pursue in due course. Uh, I don't even think I've seen Rescue Dawn. I've only seen his other uh, documentary and stuff. Did uh, we, so you? Did you and I not see Rescue Dawn with Drew in the cinema? I remember going to see it mm. at the cinema, but I can't remember which of you guys was with me. If if I did, I remember nothing of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't it remember a... anything of it either, apart from Christian <laughs> Bale in a hut. Um, so, uh, no, this is the, the this really is weird, and I'm not quite sure how it manages to pull off the trick. It does. I think Herzog is just bold faced enough, uh, and certainly with with Nick Cage backing him up, just to somehow get away with it. It is plot wise. Quite aside from Cage's character, it is probably like the most boring episode of NYPD Blue. It's yeah. <laughs> literally like 45 minutes worth of cop show plot and not even that much interaction between the other cops kind of thing. Um, yeah. And then the rest of it is just propped up by this performance from Cage. And I don't know how he gets away because that's... Uh, it feels like it could have been a pretty cheap buy-in at the start to have him do the right thing and rescue that guy. Um, mm. Because then thereafter, he really shows no evidence of of that kind of altruism again at yeah. all in the film. But you still kind of come round to being, you know, towards the end of the film, kind of feeling glad that things seem to be on the mend for him. Yeah. Although I do just get the impression that toward the end of the film, Herzog had played about with the script so much that they had no idea how they were going to turn it, you know, to tie everything up. And he's just said, yeah. okay, well, everything got better. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll buy that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've, we've had the point of view shot from the uh, lizards, so yeah, at this point, it's fine. <laughs> Go with anything you like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but no, it is, and it's a reminder to me as well of... Actually, how much I enjoy Nicolas Cage when he's being good, sort of crazy, because I feel like as I feel like as an audience, it's it's become very uncool to just enjoy Nick Cage for being Nick Cage. And there was a time when we were all really glad for him to be doing this stuff, and now it yeah. feels like you can only get away with saying that you enjoyed a Nick Cage performance if you're like, I mean, ironically, um, mm. and it's like, no, actually, he has put in some really good performances in the last. Because um, my God, when was his last bona fide sort of box office thing? When was I know National Treasure were like terrible films, but they did well at the box office. And I think I feel like those are the last significant things he did. Those and knowing would knowing be like two thousand and seven or something earlier, perhaps. Oh, no, no, knowing was two thousand and nine. Um, right. No, um, since then he's not really been doing much that is big Hollywood style stuff. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's he's, he's obviously never stopped working, um, but. It, there's been certainly good things like Mom and Dad and Mandy and things like that that he's done, mm. and he's been <laughs> he's put in some very interesting performances in, but yeah, nothing that I can think of that yeah. is 
you know. nothing, nothing that seems to have geared them back up to the big leagues again, which I would I would really like to see at some point because there's enough evidence scattered about the sort of this this last ten years to suggest that we really probably should have Nick Cage back in more bigger stuff now. Uh, yeah. Although I don't know if he's just burned so many bridges with uh, with the studio system that that's just not likely to happen. Yes, and I always like a Nick Cage performance, so even when he's. You know, on his, even even when he's perhaps not so invested in the role, but uh, I mean, the strange thing is, for when you see him interviewed for all of his, the really sort of incredibly madcap performances that he puts in, he he can give an interview where he actually rationally explains why he was doing everything he is, and you listen mm-hmm. to him going, yeah, yeah, okay, I get that, that all makes sense, and it's only when you go back and watch what he actually did at the end, and his. <laughs> Wait a minute, is he tricky? Uh, hang on, what? <laughs> it's like, like, there is some method to his madness, but it is important to understand that it is definitely madness. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> and, and when you watch this, it's hard... <sighs> It's hard. It's hard to imagine that there's not something wrong in the man's mind. To I, there's there was a scene in this that I completely forgot about. The one where he he apprehends one of the suspects by sneaking into the house next door and out the back, then in the back door, yeah. and then he escorts the guy out the front door. And as he walks out, <laughs> I mean, having been in a life and death situation, as he walks out, he just turns around and smiles at his colleagues and announces, "I love it. I just love it." <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I'm like, I don't think, I don't think he's in character just now. I think Nick Cage is just commenting on life. <laughs> there is really something genuinely sort of un, uh, unbalanced about the man in a way that only he can really uh, pull off on screen and yeah. not have the audience just fold immediately. And uh, <laughs> it's a really powerful thing when it's utilised properly. And you know, it doesn't. I don't think Herzog lets him go completely uh, wild here by any means. I don't think it's the wildest Cage performance we've seen, but I feel like it's just the right balance for what they're clearly trying to achieve with that character. Um, yeah, I mean, he's actually surprisingly reined in for an awful lot of it. Yeah. Um, he's uh, he's no more mad in his performance than Herzog is in his some of his um, directorial choices in this film. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, and it, it kind of fits the character as well, as I've said, because he does have moments of humanity. But he's not doing the right thing, but he does seem he does you know, genuinely care about his family and mm. his um, girlfriend, which is you know, distinctly not the case in Harvey Keitel's mm. uh, version, whose family seems to he seems to more or less ignore them anytime he interacts with those guys. So uh, yeah, it, it kind of fits the character. It's only when he's uh, partaking of a few illicit substances that he tends to go a bit more off the rails and get a bit more classic cage, if you yeah. like. And uh, yes, it's, it, it works for the character, which is, I guess, what, you, what you're looking for in an acting performance. It fits the character very well. It does. Yeah, I'm really glad we, I'm really glad we rewatched this, actually. Um, it's kind of rekindled my fondness for it, which, you know, at the time, which I'd then sort of very much forgotten about in the intervening years. So I think... It, you know, two viewings ten years apart where I felt pretty much the same way about it and enjoyed it just as much mm-hmm. would suggest that this is probably one I should have on a on a corner of the shelf somewhere as an interesting curio. Yes, I mean, I enjoyed it. It is not going to change your world. Um, it is by no means the, the best film you'll, you'll ever see, but it is solidly enjoyable. And um, it's remained solidly enjoyable, as you say, a decade apart from the last viewing. So there's definitely something to be said for uh, coming back to this at some point in the future again, just to see how well it holds up 20 years down the line. Um, yes, yes I, I would certainly recommend anyone who has not seen it so far, rectify that as rectify that forthwith. And uh, yeah, it's, it is good. You I, would suge- it. I would suggest there's a case to be made for a podcast where we look at his, uh, we handpick his best performances from the last 10 years with this as a starting off point. There we go. Classic a- guy. There's a proposal for you. Yes. Um, And that would also be a good excuse to watch Colour Out of Space. Mm. (laughs) Hmm.